Hello everyone, welcome to Management Information Systems Unit number four. In unit number four, we're going to be talking about uh, infrastructure. So we're going to talk about IT infrastructure. <clears throat> this is very simple. We're talking about the hardware. We're talking about the physical part mostly. So let's let's go through it. Let's try not to take too long time because uh, this is a um, this is a topic that really takes a very long time because if we go very technical then we will have to describe many of the functions of the computers servers etc so we're not going to go through that we will try to understand it in a in a nutshell really what is it infrastructure and how that works for companies which is what we mainly are looking for Right, so first of all, we're going to look at the definition of the IT infrastructure. So in this case, we have three main things, which is the computing flat platforms, providing the computing services, physical facilities, and the IT management. So we have um, the computing platforms, which is in this case, it could be the computers themselves. It can be the servers itself. We have the physical facilities management services, which is how we manage those computers, how we manage uh, all those servers, how we update them. Um, we need to understand that we have the physical part, but we need to take care of that physical part. And then that goes together with the IT management, which is also part of um, whenever we update any of the systems, we need to train the people and to make sure that everything is running well. So um, we need to understand that nowadays there's an ongoing digital transformation. So many companies are trying to switch to digital, digital processes uh, to be more effective, to be faster, to be more productive. And that involves spending money on it. And that means spending money on the computing platforms, which is on the hardware, on the servers, and in general, and keeping that up all the time. So it's, it's difficult, right? I have to spend a lot of money, but there's something that here we need to do a parenthesis, which is, um, like I said, it's expensive, but we need to pay for it. And that's something that companies are still not understanding. They see like, oh, no, we have to invest a lot of money in computing systems and digitalizing. And yes, we want to have a digital transformation, but it's expensive. So we have to think of what are the benefits of bringing all that IT infrastructure and what do we need to do it? So um, the same as paying electricity, we have to pay for IT too. So uh, that means we need to ask ourselves many questions as companies as in what are our requirements, our operational requirements? I mean, uh, why do we need to digitalize? Is it absolutely necessary? Do we need to digitalize all the process or just some parts of it? How big is my corporation? How many employees I have? How many processes I have? Is it really worth it to invest so much on a on a very very integral system or not so we have to ask many questions about who we are as a company where we want to head uh, so as to decide what kind of infrastructure we need what kind of uh, computers we need what kind of systems we need and that's going to open a pandora box because we have to think who are going to be the providers of that infrastructure, right? And like I said, we're going to manage it. If we're a small company, can we manage it or not? If we're a company, big company, then maybe we can manage it because we have the resources. We can have an IT department. We can have uh, that IT department that, that really focuses on keeping all the IT updated day to day. But if we have a company of I don't know, small, medium, 100 employees, maybe, or even less than that. We cannot have an IT department. We can, we have to rely on someone else. And, and already 
IT companies understand that problem, that issue, and that's precisely where uh, new some of the new services like cloud services or IT services, um, so, uh, IT as a service, and then they come in and they say, okay, you cannot manage it. I manage it for you. Just make sure that uh, you pay it every month or every year or so, depending on the arrangement. And again, uh, how much money you need to pay for that, right? So um, we have a constant evolution of IT, right? We we started with um, having not having computers pretty much, right? And then we start to go to the personal computer era. Then we start to talk about the client or the server, which is we store data in, let's say, physically in our in our, in our location, and then we start. The enterprise computing era, which is already larger corporations start to store all the data. And then we have the latest one, which is the cloud and mobile computing, which means mostly we don't have servers. For you guys that don't know what's a server, a server is pretty much like a large computer that has stored all the information. It's like a massive CPU. A CPU stored in, in a room, keeps all the data, secure, safe, and everybody has access to it. Huh? So we are seeing that physical, uh, like I said, I mean, we have to understand the needs of the company and the resources. So keeping a server is very expensive in many ways. Uh, firstly, because, uh, firstly, because of the electricity that it requires, right? The maintenance that it requires in terms of uh, keeping it updated. Uh, some of the servers have some cooling systems, so keeping the, the, the temperature, keeping the data safe, security, having access to it, not having any lags, any cuts off. Uh, because in the end, we need to understand that sometimes uh, information is delayed if a server is not working properly. So. Mm, you have seen it already in our university system that sometimes they need to update it, right? So anyways, uh, maintaining servers was not not really easy. So a cloud and mobile computing comes in, which is I don't need a server anymore physically there. So pretty much uh, companies like, uh, like uh, Microsoft or like Amazon, yes, Amazon, the company you know from me, retail they came up with cloud computing which is you can store your data on my server you don't need a server there so i will just provide it to you a uh, yearly fee mostly they do yearly fees or multi-year fees right and then we can do it here for example we have the case of a very large large company that has a server external server netflix that's a very good example they they rely on um, Amazon Web Services. And it's kind of funny because we will say like, but Amazon Prime has, you know, why are they helping the competition? Because for them it's business too. So we need to understand that too, right? So anyways, we have that. And uh, we need to understand what are the technology drivers of infrastructure evolution. So what has, what has really happened in what we have seen throughout just to tell you a little bit of the history of computers somehow, not technology, because the history of technology is, is we go back in millennia. Uh, the history of computers, we're talking about how the computing systems have become faster and cheaper. When we talk about computers, we're talking about the 1960, one computer was the size of a football field. And that has changed because uh, computing system, and, 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 and I mean, it was a computer as large as a football field, and it, it was only able to do one or two operations, which was just cataloging some, some very simple information. So we go to that, to having a small computer here, right? So, and who knows, I mean, next time may not even be physical. A phone might not be even physical. We don't know where it's gonna head that, right? But anyways, what we're talking here is that Computer power is getting stronger and stronger. We are looking right now at quantum computing, which is uh, still, remember about the football field story just now that I tell you? The same thing is for quantum computing. Uh, well, that one was very, very expensive. 
the, it was a football field. And the same thing with quantum computing right now. It's not accessible for everyone. Right now we're working on a binary code for computers which measures 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. All that you see in my computer, what I did it is when you decode it, it becomes zeros and ones. So this quantum computing, what it does is works at a completely different level, is way faster. And uh, at this point of time, if you have a quantum computer, pretty much you can hack on any single system that you want, everything, you know, and I mean everything from Google to Facebook to, I mean, and I'm talking about not social media, but I'm talking companies that have very strong security, right? So this data, uh, well, this, this computing is increasing. Then we also have the technologies becoming smaller. In smaller spaces, we are creating microchips. We have a better technology that process faster and smaller. And that's fantastic because we can have uh, smaller computing devices, right? And um, of course, like I said, I mean, also e the exponential size, growth size of the internet. Internet, now everybody has internet. Well, I mean, we still have a digital divide and we talked about that the previous unit, but in general is increasing. We've been moving from 1G to 5G and already 6G coming. So, I mean, we're talking that that one is coming. And uh, um, of course, I mean, uh, we need to understand that all this, um, all this technology has implications for many things, for environment, for many things. No, there was a, the case of, uh, um, well, Bitcoin and all these kind of coins, right? So we're talking about digital currencies in the, in the future, and that sounds fantastic, but there's always an implication as in, how much energy we need to produce that. And that is one of the main concerns of digital currencies because, I mean, uh, when we're talking about physical currencies, it's physical, yep, money, you get it in, you get it out. That doesn't require much energy, right? Uh, but maintaining all these databases that have all these cryptocurrencies uh, requires a lot of energy and mining requires an exponential amount of energy. So actually at this point of time, if we say we're going to do all cryptocurrencies, no? now, they were saying it's it's coming, the, the e-dollar or the e-yuan, uh, the e-yuan is the one the most advanced right now. We don't have the physical capacity to do it right now because in the end, the computing... The computing power is not strong enough yet. It's not at that point that we really can make it sustainable. We need too much energy, too many computers. So what we have to do is precisely what has been going on right now, which is advance the technology, make it more cost efficient. And then once we have that, those platforms and that IT infrastructure, then we can think about having digital currencies as well as protecting the data and so on. Okay. Very good. So then here, for example, there, there's a couple of images in here and I'm just going to go very quickly through them as in how, again, the processing power has gone exponentially from 1970 to 2018, right? The processing power and the number of transistors, of course, has changed a lot uh, from a football field to pretty much small devices. And the same thing, falling cost of chips, the same thing, microchips have gone cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and that is precisely why you are able to have uh, this uh, Tom drives with a fantastic amount of storage for very little cost and, and that is a very good example of how 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 this falling cost has happened right and the same thing the amount of storage per dollar so um, we can store more information and that has given way to other things such as big data as we have more and more information, more data, we can store more. We can also do the analysis of that big data, okay? And the same thing, the declines in internet communication cost. Uh, we can see that the cost per kilobit has declined over the past 20 years, right? And that means that we have, uh, I mean, you probably don't remember, but uh, for us in 2000, when the internet started to come in and when we really started to discover it, um, 
downloading information was eternal. You wanted to download a song. I remember very well when we used the peer to peer, there was this uh, software called Napster. And then you try to download one song and it would take you a week <laughs> if I'm not, if I remember well. That sometimes it take you, it, you were lucky maybe two or three days, but it's not what we're looking at right now. Right now, press play, it press play and that's it, right? So again, that, that, that has gone, uh, the more information, the faster information, the cheaper it has become. And so um, this is good. This is good for us, right? So anyways, so we're going to go to the components of IT infrastructure, all of these seven. Uh, so I'll go through one by one, uh, just very quickly, just very quickly. Okay. So we have, well, here, we need to understand, uh, firstly, the IT infrastructure ecosystem because all of this work together, right? Some of them, some of these, um, some of these components, we will manage them. Some others, another company we will manage, will be managed, uh, they will manage them for, for us, right? But anyways, let's go through that. So in this case, first of all, we have the client machines, which is the physical part of it, all right? So in this one, we have the, the, the laptops, the desktops, the tablets, etc., etc., the servers and the mainframes. Okay, so in this case, we need to understand that we have mainframes or the physical part of it. That's the tangibles, and regardless what company, even you know, cloud computing services, they do have physical servers, right? That we need somewhere to store it. Then. The second thing we have the operating system, which is pretty much uh, the software that we have. We have, for example, the Windows Server, the Unix, the Linux. So this uh, this hardware needs to be configured in order for for the operating system to work. So the computer needs a certain program to run on, and then of course, a, some of them supposedly are more efficient. Uh, IT geeks stand by Linux and saying that Linux pretty much is the best, the best language, the most efficient, yet is the least commercial. And actually Linux is free. if You are able to install Linux in your computer. But of course the problem is with compatibility. Mostly the world works on Windows, right? And then it, that is, uh, that, that's a commercial issue. But we can also talk about that in terms of the commercial part of, of uh, IT Sometimes uh, it does happen, and I'm gonna make a little parenthesis here into uh, into hardware, softwares, etc. Which is which is the best hardware? Which is the best software? Sometimes it's not about which one is the best, but which ones are integrated are able to be integrated with other companies. So we can say, well, for example, and I'm gonna go here. Here, for example, ERP applications, and I'm going to jump a little bit into that. No? So we talk about SAP. Uh, SAP. This is a German company. A uh, the best provider for ERP software. Maybe it's not the best one, but it's the largest one available. That means that probably your suppliers have it. So what you have to do? Should I choose Oracle or SAP? The problem is which one your suppliers has. Because in the end ERP, we're talking about the software and that integrates many part of your processes. So I want to be able to, let's say for example, in this case, I am the company Nike a supplier, and then I have a supplier of cotton and then I'm using SAP and they are using Oracle. So we don't talk the same language. And for us to communicate, it becomes complex. So uh, sometimes companies will agree to have the same software and that is what happens that sometimes the hardware or the software is chosen by the companies based on the availability of the suppliers or to integrate the chain. And that is something that actually the providers of software and hardware say, okay, yeah, you see your suppliers work with this company. That's why you should get me. Yeah, but it's more expensive. Yeah, but efficiency or money, that's what you want, right? So ERP softwares are pretty much softwares that integrate all our operations. I think we have talked about that in the previous unit, so I'm not going to go through hard into this. Um, again, we go into data management and storage. 
as another part of the IT where we're talking about where we store it. So we have many of these uh, companies that provide these uh, this, uh, software providers for data, for storing or processing it, right? Um, here, for example, we have SQL and Apache Hadoop. They are based on more, they are more based on processing information than really storing it, right? And then we have some other companies that also, they have uh, the ability to keep and store the data and somehow the ability also to process it, but at different levels than other sorts of this ones, okay? So now we talk about networking. So networking is the, when, when we're at a company, we are talking of how the computers are connected physically, right? So physically they are connected into a network or nowadays it's also virtually. So um, how we're connected to 10 computers so we can share a database. So these companies here, for example, Cisco is one of the, that's one of the top ones, right? Windows Server, of course, I mean, that one is, uh, is, a, is a classical, but I mean, we're talking about companies that have been in the networking for many, many years. So pretty much what they do is that they ensure that, um, that they ensure that all the connectors, <laughs> sorry, my English, that all the computers are connected, right? And that the information flows very, very freely. That is the most important thing because we're talking that sometimes we need to take decisions as companies and if we don't have the information ready, then it's difficult. Internet platforms, in this case, we're talking about how we connect to the internet, right? Um, how we have the routers, how we have some wireless, etc. We need to understand that at the company level, it's no longer I have one router. No, we have to understand how those routers are connected, um, how the network is integrated so that it connects to that internet and then we're connected. If we decided to, if we decided to have cloud services, how is this working? And that becomes very critical. So um, how we connect to the internet, how fast it is, what is its capacity and whether it can choke. In some businesses, if it chokes a little bit, no big deal. But when we're talking, for example, for some service companies, let's say a bank, a bank has no ability to choke. Why? Because you're dealing already with the money and in our transactions that need to be done effectively. I go to the bank and then, no, oh, sorry, there's no service. They cannot afford to do such things. Right? So we have the same thing as uh, consulting and system integration services. This goes to companies that um, they companies that go to companies, software companies that go to companies of services or products or anything, and they what they try to do is a system integration. They need to understand how the infrastructure of all your hardware, your software, your operations how we can make it more efficient. This is very costly, right? Because um, the reality is that most of the companies, when they decide to go for a digital transformation, they do not know how to start it. So first they start with, well, let's get some tablets. And then, okay, we have the tablets, but we don't have a server. So, okay, let's get the server. What kind of server? Well, well let's go for a cloud. Okay, let's get a cloud service. But then this networking doesn't have any software like an ERP. Okay, so let's get an ERP. So it starts to go pieces by pieces. We They transform from legacy to digital. And that is a transformation that doesn't go smoothly, right? There's still many data silos. We have spoken about that. So everything is a mess. So this company, this company has come, this consulting and system integration services come and say, okay, you have 10 tablets, you have a cloud services, you have this ERP software, but the way you have it is running only at a 10% of capacity. So you want it to run at a hundred percent and maximize the use of all of your hardware and your software, then we need to do some changes. So they start to digitalize some parts, they start to make sure how 
they do a mapping of how the information flows and based on that then they try to assess how to make it run effective right so anyways so those are the components we already talked about all the components right okay, we have the components and then let's change to the next part uh, which is the current trends in computer hardware and platform so now we're talking about a First of all, the mobile digital platform. So one of the first thing is we are no longer tied up by physical computers that cannot move, like the PC, you know, the personal computer. Now you have a laptop, you can bring your work in and out, right? But that already has some implications. We need to understand how we access the networks safely. Because, well, maybe for some for some companies, well, majority of the companies have very sensitive data. But of course, there's companies that have way more sensitive data than others. So can we access through a secure location or how we are accessing our servers? So yeah, maybe my work give me a computer and I can connect at home with my computer, but maybe I cannot access the network uh, from home, right? Because it's a secure network, then they know that if I connect at my house, probably someone can go and in and hack it. So we need to understand, again, mobi mobile digital platforms, they give us mobility, they give us flexibility, but we need to understand how that creates a problem in terms of security securing date, so we need to understand that, right? And then we're talking here, for example, of the consumer consumerization of IT and bring your own device. So, sorry about that. <laughs> Getting advertising, this, there's a button there whenever you pass the, the cursor goes on. So anyways, so in this case, we have bring your own device. This is something that is happening a lot right now, which is for the consumers, yeah, you need to bring your own device. You need to do it without yourself or the same thing for employees. Now it's no longer I give you a computer. It's you bring your computer. It's your tool of work and that's it. It's like your paper. So, all right, I'll give you access to it or so. But anyways, so, so this has caused many, many issues in terms of employees being tied to their work. 24-7, right? So um, other trends, like I was saying, quantum computing, these computers are extremely fast. They use quantum physics to represent and operate data. Uh, as far as I know, there's only one or two companies that have quantum computers. Google claims to have one. IBM doesn't believe that they do have it, but I mean, that's what they say. Uh, and I think the other one is IBM, if I'm not wrong. But anyways, uh, this quantum computing is at the very early stage. Then we go to another trend, virtualization. We already talked about that. Rather than having data physically, we're having it on the cloud. What is the cloud? It's just, it's, I can access it through internet anytime. As long as I have internet access, then we go through that. Right, and this one goes together with virtualization, like I said, virtualization of data, and that goes together with the cloud computing. When we're talking about virtualization, we also go as uh, infrastructure as a service, software as a service, platform as a service. So, in this case, we're talking about uh, having servers that are not there, um, access to computers that are not there, right? So, um, pretty much moving from physical to virtual and that that is that is that is good but like i said we have problems with the um, security right very good okay here's the concerns of security and reliability what if the system or the cloud cannot be accessed uh and this happens very often uh now many services like for example hotels they do have the chicken systems and instead of having a server in the hotel and access to the data in the hotel, they have this kind of uh, this kind of reservation systems that are clouds. System breaks, internet breaks, then they have no access to data. Nothing, zero, right? Very good. Then we have 
edge computing. This is a bit of a odd, um, how to say, not odd, but <laughs> it's part of going backwards. We have physical, we move to cloud. And edge computing is going back to physical, meaning that instead of having everything in the cloud, we have part of the data and part of the processing power into the physical device. So that means that, for example, uh, we don't need, and I'll give you an example. We have, for example, Netflix, and you have this function of downloading some of the content and some of the things. So this is precisely what we're talking about. You can download things and you can have some of those processes or passwords or documents or things in the physical part, and then you don't need the connection for it. So um, this helps because we don't spend much time connecting or retrieving the information, and that kind of works well. Right here, Amazon Web Services, cloud computing. Um, like I said, hey, these are AWS. Actually, Amazon, Amazon, Amazon and Microsoft, Microsoft Azure, and then I don't know how to pronounce it. I don't know if it's Azure, Azure, <laughs> Microsoft. Anyways, they these two companies have been driving, thriving, and uh, and they have rescued some of their sales because of their cloud computing services. Amazon Web Services is doing fantastically. While for them, some of their costs have increased due to the labor and so many things, many issues pertaining for, to, to the COVID-19 issues, their web services are over the moon. Uh, this is a business unit that for them is working very, very well. Right. And same for Microsoft. Microsoft Microsoft is very involved in China when it comes to this uh, uh, with and cloud services and their, their their Chinese unit is doing very well. So anyways, we go to uh, green computing. As I mentioned earlier, computing, processing data requires a lot of energy. Actually, we actually we pollute a lot because of the current system that we have, which is, for example, every time that we connect to the internet, every time that we download something, we're generating electricity. So um, what companies are trying to do, the companies that, I mean, they manage these services or so, what they are trying to do is to... Um, make it more efficient in terms of electricity, how we can spend less energy to do the computing, uh, how can we do it faster. So in this case, we make everything more efficient so that we use less electricity. Uh, other trends that we have, well, current computer trends in software platforms, we have open source software. We're thinking of rather than having licenses allowing the consumers to freely use some certain softwares and we have we have seen it for example microsoft office you have to pay for license so what happens is that google comes in and say you can use google sheets you can use google documents you can use everything for free so what is microsoft forced to do they also launch different the, the Microsoft Office, but also the web web version, and it becomes free. So that has happened a lot. That means that we no longer require licenses for using different softwares, and I think that has uh, been good in democratizing the, the usage of, of, of data and so on, right? So very good. So, hey, like I said, um, another uh, other trends that we have is ERPs, software outsourcing, cloud-based software services, like I was saying just earlier, is letting other companies do it for me, which is pretty much, I don't know anything about IT. I don't know what softwares I require. Based on my operation, I don't know what to do or what to buy. So company, come and tell me what to do. And then they do that, right? Then we have the applications as well, mashups. Mashups is the mix of technology. For example, when we have 
when we're talking about, for example, Tinder, an application like that, that is precisely a mashup because it uses your GPS, your location, images, your Instagram. So it mixes and mashes up many applications at the same time. And that's what we're talking about, right? Uh, here, for example, we have, uh, well, we're talking about web services. And then, like I was saying, for example, for hotels, I mentioned earlier how they are using clouds to rent and then the consumer can access to see if there's any rooms available, etc. rather than calling last time, are there any rooms available? No. Now you can go in, check the availability, how much is, you can reserve, you can check in, you can do everything by yourself, right? Very good. So now um, let's talk about dealing with platform and infrastructure change. So in this case, we need to understand, like I said, when we when we are planning to do a digital transformation, are we going to do it by ourselves? Do we have the means to do it by ourselves or we need someone else to do it? And first, we're all talking about the issue of scalability, which is I have an operation this size, but I foresee that in the future I'm going to grow. Do I need a larger capacity? Can I expand the system? We need to think of those things and how to make it more effective. Um, we need to change the policies and procedures, the way to do things. Probably we are used to do things in one way and digitalizing requires us to do new systems, new processes. And then as we spoke in units, previous units, companies, the culture may resist to that change. Secondly, the politics of the company, um, they do not allow to do changes because Mm, their vision and mission does not align with those IT changes, right? So we have those issues that do not allow the change to happen and that happens very good. So the same thing in the management and governance. So we have to understand who controls the IT. Do we do it? Another company does it. If we do it, um, how much power has the IT department, the IT division? Right, um, it, it is happening nowadays that the IT division, like for example, a chief information officer uh, has way much more power in some certain ways than the CEO because they are the ones that know where the data comes in, how it moves, where it moves, how to control the data and data is power, right? So um, we need to think of this very carefully. So, um, like I said, we need to take decisions as in how is going to be when we implement the systems, how are we going to run them? So we buy it, we buy computers, we buy servers, we rent them. We need to understand security in terms of safety of the data. We need to understand what will be the impact of inputting a new technology. If uh, we put a new system, a new process, how would that improve my operation? Is it worth the investment or not? Most of the time it's worth it. However, it may happen that we invest a lot of money and we do not use it efficiently or effectively because the transformation didn't happen at the training level. We have a fantastic system, but we didn't train the people. So it's a waste of money and time, right? So like I said, in this case, we need to understand the total cost of ownership model, which is we need to understand direct and indirect cost as in first are, yeah, I need to invest in some hardware, some tablets, some servers, if I go for servers and then uh, laptops, etc., etc. Training, I need to, I need to train my staff I need to do maintenance. I need to understand how I'm going to move all that data, migrate that legacy data into digital data. So in this case, how much I'm spending every month for this. And this cost, this is precisely the total cost of ownership. So in this case, we're going to be thinking, I need to pay for electricity. I need to pay for employees. I need to pay for IT. And how much of my total revenue is the cost of technology, right? Maybe 10%, 20%, can I minimize it? How can I minimize it? So like I said, uh, companies, what they don't understand is they implemented 
and they don't see the, the monthly cost of technology and we need to we need to know it we need to know it and manage it too the same thing as oh i'm spending too much money on employees and i need to fire one i am spending too much money on it how can i optimize it right very good so uh well we need to understand also the competitive forces both for IT infrastructure investment so like i said we need to understand uh who needs my products or my services? What is my strategy? What is my IT strategy? My infrastructure available? The cost that it cost me? Uh, whether another company is gonna come and assess my technology? Whether other companies have what systems they do have and do I need to match up with them so I can be competitive, right? And then I need to understand which companies provide the services that I need. So we knew, we need to do a macro environmental analysis of why we need this technology and how we're going to invest on it. Okay, and then we have a little bit of a, a, a figure of why we need to do it, right? So um, that's it, pretty much that's it. It's not, it's not a very fun unit, but uh, it's about hardware, but hopefully uh, this works very well. And then I'll see you next week.